A lot of new updates come in this week as we see a lot of exciting development and pressure against Microsoft. I'm ready to dive in by talking about Microsoft RNDIS, the Remote Network Driver Interface Specification Protocol across Linux USB drivers, which has now received a patch from Greg Pro Hartman, who's a major Linux kernel developer and perhaps a successor to Linus himself, has called for the disabling of all RNDIS protocol drivers, stating that they're Protocol is inherently insecure and poses vulnerabilities when used with untrusted hosts or devices. And since the protocol has become obsolete and unnecessary for modern systems, Greg has chosen to remove them from the Linux kernel. Windows only needed this for XP and newer systems. Windows systems older than that can use the normal USB class protocols instead, which do not have these problems. Android has had this disabled for many years, so there should not be any real systems out there that need this. This, of course, is important to Linux, and I'm glad that we remove things that are antiquated, especially when it comes to Microsoft. What this does for us is by completely disabling RNDIS, Linux systems are now protected against potential vulnerabilities. There's a reduced attack vector, and I think this is a great commitment for maintaining a secure kernel for our Linux distributions. And then moving right into the Free Software Foundation and how they want to keep putting pressure on Microsoft. The highlight here is that the Free Open Source Foundation wants to counteract Microsoft's influence on software freedom, criticizing things like a TPM module in Windows 11, which is forcing upgrades on consumers. As Windows 10 is soon to stop receiving security updates, it may be the best time to start thinking about swapping operating systems. Whether that's Mac OS or going to Linux, they're calling for the boycott of platforms and software from Microsoft as well, including things like GitHub. I say what's crucial now is to keep putting pressure on Microsoft, whether that's through switching to new Linux, avoiding new releases of their software or actions as simple as moving your projects off of Microsoft GitHub. If you're concerned about e-waste or have friends who work to combat climate change, getting them together to, to tell them about free software is the perfect way to help our movement grow and free a few more users from the Microsoft digital restrictions. Quite the post as they're trying to really just spread awareness across the board to promote the GNU Linux adoption, try to reduce e-waste, give people digital freedom, and overall build a stronger community that focuses on freedom of software, hardware, and platforms. Speaking of freedom, a 20-year-old project, the Fish Shell, has been completely rewritten from C++ to Rust, which is a significant milestone. And what's wonderful is Fish just gave us a blog post that talks about the limitations and the benefits of porting the code over from C++ to Rust. This is significant because it comes with its own challenges, technical wins and losses, and has a lot of community impact. As you can imagine, this was no easy feat as it took just at a year to do. And it all started with about two years ago, our head maintainer Ridiculous opened what quickly became our most read pull request. That's because it sparked a lot of debate. Now, Fish is not a stranger to actually changing languages. It was ported from pure C to C++, in its early days, and now with the beta of Fish 4.0 containing 0% C++ and 100% pure Rust. That is quite the undertaking to do in under a year. I go into this a lot more in depth in a previous video, which, which I'm gonna post in the description below. You might wanna check this out if you're very interested in how the port actually happened and what all transpired there, but I'm gonna go through the sections real quick here. And with that being said, take a moment to subscribe below as you wouldn't wanna miss more videos like this in the future. Also, don't forget to hit that like button. It gets this video out to more people so they can enjoy it too. Let's continue on. Why are we doing this again? Well, they're explaining it right here. Tools and compiler platform differences, ergonomics and thread safety and community. Next thing, why Rust? While some people might think it's funny, the novelty of being able to use a new language and learn something new is actually a big deal. And it is important to these maintainers and contributors. For one, Fish is a hobby project and it means that we want it to be fun for us. Nobody is paid to do work on fish, so we need it to be fun. Being fun and interesting also attracts contributors. They also talk about Rust having great tooling. It's easy to get the tooling installed, great ergonomics, including talking about the differences between C++ pointers, which can always be null, and, and Rust options are apparent very quickly, even to those who have never used it before. Having an explicit use system where we know exactly which function comes from which module is a great improvement over hashtag include. Rust makes it nice to add dependencies, but the number one feature here for less, at least from Fish Shell's perspective, is the send sync, statically enforcing rules around threading. The ability to do fearless concurrency is too strong, making implementation of multi-threading easy with extra confidence and correctness. 
So the story of the port. While the fish team used a fish of Theseus approach to rewrite the shell in Rust, transitioning components from C++ one at a time. That way, the program remained functional throughout the entire transition, and it also allowed for cont continual testing and additional releases during the transition. So this incremental porting approach made it great to avoid major refactoring during the port as they used the FFI glue to connect C++ Rust components together. That way they could phase out C++ code. The timeline, the initial pull request was opened in January 28th, 2023 and merged on February 19th, 2023, which was when they initially started the port. The last C++ code was removed then by Fish 3.7.0, another release of C++ branch was to flush out some accumulated improvements and was released at the beginning of the last year. The last C++ code was removed on January 2024 and some additional tests were ported from C++ to C the 12th of June 2024. The first beta was released on December 17, 2024, just recently. Now the gripes, mistakes, good, sad, and future and present. The elimination of the Encurses library dependency is going to simplify builds by removing global state issues. That's wonderful. Self-installable binaries are going to make fish portable as well without the use of root access. There's going to be improved performance just because of memory usage is more predictable now and slightly exceeds the C++ version in some cases. There's easier maintenance and extensibility. Tools like Cargo are going to improve developer workflows, and it looks like there's more community engagement, which has revitalized the project. The bad things though, portability issues have come of this. Rust system abstraction requires manually enumerating targets, leading to duplicated work and potential for errors. Localization challenges. Rust format of strings are not translatable requiring custom solutions like porting printf, tooling frictions, slow performance from things like Rust Analyzer due to the large code generation, limited capabilities in cargo, necessitating retention of CMake for certain things, lost platform support, Sigmon is no longer supported, build times, link time, optimization and release builds made build times longer during development, some C++ legacy remains, things like UTF 32-bit strings are retained and required for additional work for full modernization, while it's not perfect here, this is a great story of how a port from C++ and Rust succeeded in a pretty big project. It seems to have created a more reliable and extensible code base. The Fish project overcame a lot of challenges and had a lot of creative solutions, and I'm very excited to see how this all pans out as. Rust is only becoming more and more popular around the Linux open source community. And we're going to talk about how Bottles is also introducing Rust and LibCosmic into the Bottles next release, which is a wild announcement as well, as Bottles is a very important tool that allows you to run Windows software on Linux, including applications and games. It includes things like sandboxing, customization, a dependency manager, a gaming environment and platform, which you can manage your applications all within the sandbox. It is a wonderful alternative built on top of Wine to run Windows software easily. I have a video on how to install this for your own computer, but I wanna talk about the announcement here. I'll put that video in the description below so you can check it out. If you haven't heard of Bottles, it's one of the best tools to use Windows software on Linux. So over a year ago, they announced Bottles Next, a complete rewrite of the Bottles project. Initially, the idea was to leverage web technologies to achieve the experience we envision for our users. However, as often the case, Extensive research, decisions, experimentations, and continuous reevaluations followed. Why did we go through all this trouble? Well, to ensure we make the right choices. After the announcement, we started experimenting with many technologies, but above all, listened to the community's feedback, particularly regarding concerns about Electron. This prompted us to explore other paths, leading us to prototype frameworks tailored to Bottle's next specification needs. And here we are today, the title says a lot. This announcement is a complete rewrite of their tool to include Rust in their new stack. They're going to use LibCosmic from System76 for its GUI, C Sharp and .NET for the Windows API integration, and GTK Client will remain available for users preferring the current interface, but overall they're planning on adopting Rust. Why? Well, Rust is a highly performant and robust language with growing community. To be honest, it wasn't my first choice. I would have had been more comfortable sticking with Go, but unfortunately there are no quality GUI toolkits for Go that will align with our goals. And here we're given a preview of what that front end would look like. And in the coming days, they plan on kicking off a new development team. And the first task on the list would be to draft and achieve a basic version of all the following three components, client, server, and agent. They'll publicly announce the repositories whenever they start working on this. This is a pretty bold step forward for the Bottles project. 
citing some of the very same things that the fish shell did. So we're about to see a whole nother massive project transition over to at least partially rust. It's a pretty big deal as it just seems like more and more projects are contemplating and deliberating whether or not they're gonna go to Rust as an alternative. The main place where I see this is C++ code actually getting ported over to Rust. Not really C code, although it's heavily hit the Linux kernel, but there's a lot more drama around that specifically because it's such a massive project with so many different maintainers and people working on it. It's hard to make clear cut goals like switch the whole project over to Rust in the Linux kernel. But that isn't to say that C and C++ is not trying to make a safer way to use memory in the language. As a Clang-based safe C++ has been announced, which is an extension to Clang that enforces stricter safety checks while maintaining compatibility standard with C++. It adds two new pragmas. And the key features to those are borrow checking, which mimics Rust borrow checker to detect lifetime and mutability issues, compatibility, which will ensure standard compilers can compile it using strict subset of ISO C++ in future potential as it aims for safe C++ to become part of the C++ standard. They give us a quick example, which detects the use of a dangling pointer as safe C++ aims to bring Rust-like safety to C++ while preserving compatibility and portability. It's going to try to leverage Clang IR for advanced analysis and introduce pragmatic step-by-step -step approach to adopting safer coding practices. This goes quite in depth with some examples, but it just goes to show you how important this topic has become, even in other languages that don't currently offer a memory safe environment. That's why Rust adoption has become so prevalent. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Clang IR, it's an intermediate representation introduced for Clang compiler specifically designed to handle C and C++ based languages. It acts as a middle layer between Clang's AST abstract syntax tree and the LLVM IR by leveraging ML IR multi-level intermediate representation. And it enables more advanced analysis and optimizations for C and C++ programs. The key features include things like higher level semantics, tight clang integration, flexible and extensible transformations, lifetime and safety checks, progressive lowering, and extra tooling support. Although it's a work in progress, they have some lofty goals trying to benefit diagnostics, optimizations, and community. We'll see how the project stacks up in the future. And also is a big deal because as of late, we see a lot of projects contemplating whether or not they're going to move their entire code base to Rust because of some of the improvements that you get with the language. This is perhaps C and C++'s way of combating future projects from moving over. Anyways, to another exciting mention, GIMP 3.0 RC2 was released. It only took about 20 years to finally get GIMP 3.0, but now we're seeing RC release candidate numbers go up and up. The new candidate receives important bug fixes, including updates to the setting, migration, Windows console, missing GUI fonts, issues on Mac OS, and Darktable integration. Enhancements include GEGL filter API, layer blend spaces and compositing in XCFs, extra packages including app image and flat pack, BMP plugin improvements, and other assorted updates. Here's what the missing fonts look like on Mac OS. You can see a whole bunch of symbols here representing fonts instead of the actual font itself. This was all fixed. So if you are using GIMP on Mac, make sure to update to the latest release candidate too. Some quality of life improvements were made to the Python console. You can now use Control R and Control S shortcuts to search through the command history. And last but not least, we're receiving new updates in GNOME. The GNOME desktop and the core applications and libraries have received an update specifically to the image viewer. Image editing now includes crop, rotate, flip, and has been merged into Lupe. Currently only PNG images are supported. Support for JPEGs is in the works. This There's a list of open issues and current implementation. You can support it financially on several platforms, but regardless, we're seeing great updates being applied to the image previewer or viewer where we can do simple functions like edit our photos. This is a very welcome thing as it's been missing for many, many years. There's so many desktop apps and previewers or image viewers that can already do this. It took forever for GNOME to get this finally in, but nonetheless, I'm happy to see it getting included with their applications. Here are some more options that you can make including choosing free-formed aspect ratio, meaning you can move this around however you want. The original square, 5, 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 16, 9, rotating and flipping. All very simple things, but they're necessary in order to make quick image manipulations. And now we can finally do that. And those are some of the exciting developments here in the Linux sphere over the last week. 
a lot of improvements being made even over the Christmas weekend. I was very excited to cover all these things. So if you were as well, make sure to hit that like button for me to get this out to more people, as well as think about subscribing below. You've made it to the end of the video and you clearly enjoy the content. You wouldn't want to miss more in the future. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.